this gaming PC. <laughs> yeah, it's I got a new lens, and so now people can see what happens next to me. And Aww. yeah, <laughs> cool. And I will set this up again so it actually goes to our um the product club meeting page. All right, so there we go. Perfect. So I'm I'm getting people have entered the waiting room, admit them. Am, am I a host? I made you a co-host just to make okay. it easier so you can see um messages that are being sent um, from everybody. Okay. But, well <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to the extent that I can multitask that much. Yeah. We'll handle um admitting people and multitasking. Okay. Okay, <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, thank you, both of you, for coming. Uh, we just have a, a little bit of club business at the top, um, just to get through really quickly. Um, just to start things off, um, we're still doing our call for membership. So um, uh, you can go to our website, alamedademocraticclub.org, and sign up, renew your um, registration. But next month, we're actually having our dues, brews, and what was it? Sorry, I'm off the top of my head and I lost my tab. Our do's brews and issues <laughs> um event uh at almanac brew house um so our first in-person meetup to try to get everyone together and um everyone talk about issues and hopefully bring out people to actually talk about issues so that is on june 7th at 5 p.m at almanac out on um the base it's going to be a great event so hope everyone can make it um on top of that, we do have a vacancy still on the board. If you're interested, sh shoot a message to any one of us on the board. Um, we need a VP of activities to help out with all the organization and everything that we do here. So um, if anyone is interested, we're looking for help. <laughs> and with that, um, just kind of jump into things. So we have our mayor and our new city manager here um, to talk about what's happening this year, at least in their plans. Um, and they were gracious enough to come to visit our, our long established club since 1985 to talk about Alameda. And so um, I just wanted to call out, this is your second term as our mayor in Alameda. You've been on the city council since 2012, which you pretty much know where everything is, you know, everything <laughs> works at this point, I hope. Um, so we just wanted to get a read on on um, what your plans are, I guess, for the next term for you. Um, and I don't know if you want to take it away and just talk about what your your overall big objectives are. <laughs> sure. No, I'd be happy to jump in. And, and greetings, City of Alameda Democratic Club. I'm, I'm one of you. I'm a proud member for a long time. And um, I am thrilled to be back serving my second term. There are so many things that I was working on that I hoped that I would have a chance to keep working on. And um, I love the results of the election. I really enjoyed walking door to door. It is hands down my favorite thing to do um, in whenever I'm either running for office or working on, on a campaign. I think there's just nothing like talking to people um, who will answer your, the door but or at the ferry term, terminals or whatever. And so um, I'm, I'm just humbled and grateful to be back. And Sort of the cherry on top is I came in with a new city manager, <laughs> so it was just um, it is delightful to be working with Jan Ott um, once again, but now in capacity as our city manager. So when I uh, ran for re-election, and I'm sure that the club had a forum, maybe it was a, a combined forum with another organization. There were so many, it's kind of a blur, but I'm sure you heard me say then, and I'll reiterate that my three top priorities, and they're all interrelated are housing, transportation, and addressing climate change and sea level rise, because as an island, sea level rise is truly an existential threat to us. And so just um, taking um, uh, housing right, right from the top, I'll take you back last night to uh, 24 hours ago, I was um, uh, in the council, uh, um, conducting the council meeting and and Zach Bowling, thank you for calling in to comment. I appreciate that because we were considering um, out at Alameda Landing, just beyond the the um, the uh, target is a um, development that is called Bay Thirty Seven. That's the residential part of it. And um, a few months back, we 
opened a lovely park, the Bahal Circle Immigrant Park. Some of you were there at the opening. It was wonderful. And now the time has come that Pulte, which is the residential developer, has a sales office out there. It's right when you enter from Fifth Street, little one-story building on a 5,000 square foot lot. So as they're finishing selling off these homes, they are not going to need the um, sales office. So then the question, and back when this development was entitled a number of years back, that was um, designated to be a commercial space. Well, post-pandemic, retail, brick and mortar retail is struggling. Alameda Landing, just a couple blocks away, has 25% vacancy in its commercial spaces. So they wanted to know, could they do um, something different? And if so, what would that be? Anyway, to make a long story short, the proposal that staff brought to us was to take that lot. Now the neighbors, um, in the at least all the ones that we heard from, who already live there, just wanted open space there, just wanted green space. Well, over the months that they've been communicating with the planning department, planning board and us, sometimes they wanted a dog park or paid parking or green space, anything but more housing. But what staff proposed is that, you know, we have this housing element that has our um, housing numbers that we need to accommodate, um, not just legally, but I would argue morally, it's our obligation to do that. And we are a little short on producing affordable housing and especially to the low income um, bracket um, range. And so this presented a wonderful opportunity to build some of those units if the developer would do that. And so anyway, we worked out the details, staff recommended do two affordable to the low income category of residents um, on, the, on the lot. And then the other, I wanna say 1,500 or was it 2,500 square feet? Um, 15, anyway, would be green space, a little park area and the developer would put that in. And, and the beauty of that is not only are those, there's these two low income affordable homes, they are for sale. And this is something you just don't see. And it's a wonderful opportunity. And we hear so much about people who just haven't been able to accumulate, acquire that generational wealth that comes when you own real property. And so it was a wonderful opportunity, but you know, we're five council members. We're not all of uh, one mind, but I'm so pleased to say that we got the majority vote. And so that is going forward. We're doing two for sale. Um, low-income affordable homes out there and then this, you know, green space, open space. And then I know that you all have been following that. I am always proud to say that Alameda, city of Alameda, was the first city in Northern California to have its housing element certified by um, the State Department of Housing Community, um, Housing and Community Development, HCD. And that's no small feat. I mean, around the state, around the Bay Area, even um, cities are being sent back to the drawing board. Some cities are still fighting and, you know, wanting to bring lawsuits. Hello, Huntington Beach. We we weren't that city. And so I'm, I'm really proud of what we're doing. And next month, and really just a couple of weeks, we are going to open Dignity Village, and I think you probably know where that is out um, alongside the um, yeah. College of Alameda track and field. And these are going to be units of transitional housing for formerly homeless individuals, up to 60 individuals with an on site residential manager and intensive wraparound services to help people transition from living on the street, living in their car to getting the services they need and connected because when you when you move there then you're connected into the system that helps locate housing for you when you're ready to move on to permanent housing and as each cohort cohort um, moves out another group can come in or individuals whenever openings come up i'm really proud of alameda for doing that so um, that's coming to us soon we hope to see um, some ground broken for the wellness center out on McKay Avenue, um, not just in our <laughs> lifetime, but I think later this year, everyone just knock on wood or think positive thoughts, whatever you do. And you probably remember that that will be up to 100 units of assisted living for frail elderly homeless individuals and seen seniors. And seniors are the largest growing uh, 
segment of the homeless population, certainly in California and probably elsewhere. And, you know, speaking of homelessness, this year I'm on the board of directors of the League of California Cities, and I was just up in Sacramento this past Friday and Saturday for our board meeting. And one day we had a speaker, he's a special assistant attorney general, works for our, um, <laughs> our neighbor um, and our attorney general, Rob Bonta, but this gentleman prosecutes um, drug-related cases, but not just any drug-related cases, fentanyl suppliers and transport. And he talked to us about the fentanyl crisis in California. It's, um, it's eye-opening, it's devastating, it's tragic. But he said something that really stuck with me, which is that we used to think that narcotics use led to homelessness. But now in the work that he's been doing in these cases, he said, we are learning that homelessness leads to narcotics use, to substance abuse. People who are living on the streets who are afraid to close their eyes and sleep overnight because it's not safe that their possessions will be stolen or they'll be harmed or worse, take meth or whatever it takes to, to keep themselves going. And then just to deaden the pain and the trauma of what you're going through, um, People will take whatever they can get their hands on. And so that just, you know, reminded me and I reminded the council last night when I reported out on having attended the meeting that whenever we have the opportunity to provide housing for unsheltered individuals or to keep people from slipping into housing insecurity, we have an obligation to do it. And this is a way that we're also helping to fight um, this fentanyl crisis. I mean, there's a lot of other things that need to be done. And, and I'm really proud of our um, state attorney general for the um, aggressive way he's going after this. Um, excuse me. And so let me, I don't want to um, drone on and on because I know you have questions. Um, <laughs> transportation, and it's related to climate change. We have to get people out of their single occupancy vehicles, especially those that are fossil fuel powered. But we have to, in town, make sure that alternative modes of transportation are available, accessible, safe. And so again, last night at our council meeting, the council voted to approve the um, conceptual, the concept, a uh, design concept for improvements to Lincoln Avenue. It's a very long street and a wide street. Zach lives just off of um, Lincoln Avenue. Yep. And, and uh, we did a little site visit there at noon yesterday. My husband and I rode our bikes over and on the way back, we rode down Lincoln Avenue, and I can attest that as a bicyclist, wow, those cars, and, and there are no, you know, there's no painted bike lanes on Lincoln, so you're just kind of share on the road, and those those cars go fast. So this is a way that, excuse me, we're going to make um, that um, north-south roadway safer for all users because it's going to go on a road diet where it's currently four lanes. For the most part, it's going to go down to three lanes, one in each direction and a left turn, uh, a center left turn lane, and just improvements for crosswalks and pedestrian crosswalks, bicycle um, uh, lanes. And so stay tuned, that work uh, will be starting. And along with what we're already uh, working on and getting started on with Central Avenue, we've got some roundabouts coming to the city to slow down traffic. And uh, we're, made, we're working with some great uh, consultants to get all these things done. Climate change is the third leg of my three-legged stool. So the things that we've been doing, we've had a climate action and resiliency plan for a number of years. Again, Alameda, we, we have to be out there you know, on the cutting edge because this is real to us. And we have a fabulous um, resiliency coordinator, Danielle Miller. But we've updated our CARP. And we've also approved ordinances recently. We did building electrification requirements for new construction a year or so ago. But more recently this year, unless it was late last year, sometimes things get a little blurred, but um, we are looking at electrification for existing homes and how to phase that in uh, because it's always easier to do something from the ground up with new construction. But you know, Alameda, a lot of our our buildings are existing and so how to go in and make these changes and so we have to help people out with phasing with education with rebate opportunities and um, we're working on that 
So that's a little overview. Oh, the other thing, I mean, I, I can't not say this um, <laughs> with, uh, with regard to transportation and climate change, you probably know that the bicycle pedestrian bridge is um, something that I've been working hard on. And I just had a meeting this afternoon, a Zoom meeting with our uh, the consultant that we're working on. And they are um, our planning, building, transportation department, our consultant, are working lots of outreach, lots of stakeholders, the city of Oakland, Alameda County, the Coast Guard, um, the Port of Oakland. There's lots of players and they're excited about what we're doing. So um, they are going to be meeting soon to narrow down the, the various possibilities of where the bridge lands on each side and all those details. But anyway, the, um, the plans at this phase are moving forward. And it's just so important because, you know, we're an island, so you get on and off Alameda by going over one of four bridges. All four of our bridges are on the east end of the island. So if you live or work or want to travel from the west end of the island by foot or by bike to Oakland or from Oakland to Alameda, unless you want to get on AC Transit, nothing wrong with that, but say you don't have the bus fare, you will have to go through the Posey tube or the Webster tube. And that those are 36 inch wide lanes right above the auto traffic with all the um, exhaust coming out, not a pleasant way to go. So this is a matter of environmental justice. It's a matter of reducing um, car trips and it's, um, it's another access um, on and off the island for bicycles and pedestrians. So I'm uh, really excited about that. Another reason I'm excited to be back for four more years. Anyway, <laughs> I will um, uh, <laughs> I will <laughs> be quiet and, and answer questions. Or did, did yeah. you want me to introduce Jan or did you tell me, um, Zach, what um, you'd like to do? I have a few questions. I, you actually right. touched upon a lot of the questions that I had already. A lot of the questions that we had put together were based on platforms within the Democratic Party, the California Democratic Party. And a lot of your points actually touch upon some of those things, one on affordable housing, climate change, um, income equality, and big topics. I think one of the ones just kind of going back um, that I have is um, we passed our housing element. We were like the first to certify our award-winning housing element. Um, a bigger question is uh, now that we've adopted it, how we're going to make sure over eight years we're going to follow through meeting all the programs that we said we would and sort of address some of those issues because it was an interesting arc to go from like measure z to where we are now as a community and um just how we balance that with some of the community concerns that we have mixed with like how are we planning for those like you talked a little about the pedestrian bridge um but like things like the ferry terminals and how we provide the infrastructure to sort of handle that um, while we meet like what we we say we are as Democrats to meet um, the need for affordable housing in the state. Just how are we going to follow through with that? Um, it, my big question. <laughs> yeah, no, great question. And I would say we're going to follow through the same way we got to this point um, of getting our housing element certified by HCD. It didn't happen overnight. I, um, I spoke on a panel in Sacramento a month or two ago. And I, I, and I, but I consulted with Andrew Thomas, our um, uh, planning, building, transportation director beforehand. I said, Andrew, just take me back. And he said, you know, and, and Zach, I'll tell you, because we worked on, on Measure Z together. He said, Measure Z was actually a big part of it. Even though the measure lost, it raised awareness and it, it plants that seed. And, and if I could just go back, it's funny. I was thinking about Measure Z, maybe because of the email you sent, but if I had it to do over again, and if I had known, I was the fundraising chair on that one, and we raised oodles of money. We had no problem. I was just so surprised. But if I'd known we were going to be so successful with fundraising, and maybe even if I didn't know, I would have done a poll first. I would have said, we've got to do a public opinion poll, because I've worked on a lot of campaigns. I've chaired a number of them, and it's just, I, I wouldn't go, well, other than personal campaigns where you don't have money for polling that's when you walk door to door but anyway but i for an issue campaign i would have said let's do a public opinion poll just like we did for the hospital i'm not the hospital i think we probably didn't have money for that but for the, for the library we definitely did a, a poll we found out what the people wanted so i'm not sure i would have loved to have known that information who knows maybe we would have passed but 
that that ship has sailed. But but Andrew thought that that actually it got the conversation going. My in in my heart of hearts, I think that people, many of them who voted no, did so just out of confusion. When people don't understand an issue uh, fully, they tend to vote against it. But the 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 measures they vote, but also the wellness center. The wellness center was one of those moments that really inspires me when I just saw the outpouring of support from the community that no, we don't want to leave our seniors, our homeless seniors to live and die on the street. And they they really came out. And then just the constant workshops. I mean, Andrew did an amazing job of going out to, you know, to different areas of the city, sometimes being really badly treated, not so with, without much civility or none at all, um, but that kind of education. And that's what you have to keep doing. And even, and, and you have to do it over again. And I, it's kind of what I felt like I was doing last night when I was talking to, gosh, I don't even know how many speakers, but we had a lot of speakers, residents from this um, development that didn't want any more new neighbors. Some of them even lived in below market rate units. And even though they were benefiting from that housing, they were saying, yeah, but that's enough, you know, no more. <laughs> and so you have to just keep, you have to speak your truth and just say, you know, green space and places to run around for kids. Yeah, that's important. But as I told them, homes are important for children too. And also this is Alameda, we have a park. You, you can't walk two blocks without coming to a park in Alameda. So you have to continue that. And then it's also, well, there's things we can't control like what the market's yeah. gonna do, what interest rates are gonna do, what um, the supply chain's gonna look like and the, the cost of supplies, but you just have to keep checking in on that. And so, you know, we have a number of sites around the city that are in various stages of entitlement. Of course, if you are moving forward on a project, you can't just let it languish endlessly because that permit will expire. So that's some of the incentive. But I will rely on our excellent city staff to just keep keep an eye on what's going on. And, and I'll tell you, I recently got a tour of um, you know the Del Monte building there on um, yeah. on Buena Vista. It is amazing. It is it's now, <laughs> it's just beautiful. And for those of you who remember all those years when it was all weedy in the front and cyclone fence, and it was just an eyesore. Now it is, it is so lovely and what they've done and it doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> I often say Rome wasn't built in a day and we weren't either, but, but there's that. And then um, Alameda Marina down on, um, Clement and that development, I'm going to get a tour there next month, but that developer, you know, put in that cycle track that runs along, along um, Clement Avenue, the developer for Del Monte helped fund um, Dean Sweeney Open Space Park. So yep. we, um, we are doing what we're doing and I look to our staff to just keep doing that. What, what we need to do as elected officials is to make sure that we are making Alameda as friendly, as user friendly as possible for people who want to come here and do developments. As I like to say, if you're a developer who's going to come in here and not argue with our um, our requirements for the um, the percentage of affordable housing we want to put in, we will welcome you with open arms. And and it's a testament that you know so many uh, different buildings um, are going up both on the main island and um, out at. Uh, Alameda Point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think for time, just kind of watching the clock, I, I'm going to ask one more question and then have you introduce Jen. And I think we can then ask questions from both of you um, and, and uh, kind of jump into it from there. But my big question, um, criminal justice reform is a big issue for the Democratic Party. Um, mm -hmm. I, big question is, uh, how do you plan just, uh, to address issues around policing, public safety, community relations? I would be remiss to not mention that today is the second anniversary of Mario and Gonzalez's death. And, um, and, and we, we can't forget that, but also with our previous city manager, um, he held these uh, reform committees um, around policing. And my big question is like, how do we implement some of what we talked about then? And then just going forward, how are we going to balance sort of what 
as Democrats care about with police reform in our local city and make sure that we're we're striking a good balance there. So uh, yeah, that's my big yeah. question. <laughs> Thank you for the question and for the acknowledgement of Mario Gonzalez's the um, anniversary of, of his death. Because the city is in active litigation with the Gonzalez family, I'm, I'm prohibited from commenting on it. But let's talk about the, um, the criminal justice reforms. And I think you all know that we have a, a new, new-ish police chief, Nishant Joshi. I think this summer it'll be uh, two years that he's been with us. But he came in with lots of reforms and lots of uh, ways that he wanted to do things differently. And, um, and I'm, I'm impressed with what he's doing. But what um, back to your question about the, um, the police reform uh, subcommittee um, on civilian oversight last year, late last year, the city council voted to create a police auditor position within the city attorney's office. So that position will be outside the chain of command for police. It will be completely separate. And recruitment is underway as we speak for this position. I checked in today with our city attorney, Ibn Shen. He says that we expect to hire before um, the summer. I know, like I said, I know they've been recruiting, I think, during some interviews. And so this is a chance to, um, to have this oversight starting from the, um, the city attorney's office that will make reports to the public. We'll see. I mean, the council will will keep um, will stay on top of that and will report back. And then there's another idea that even um, is uh, contemplating that I think ha has some merit, which is you probably know that our city attorney's office has a prosecutor's unit within it because the Alameda County DA can get so busy that they just don't take on some cases. And I mean to say cases like elder abuse, domestic violence, child abuse, um, some uh, horrendous landlord activities at times. And so, but these are important and certainly for our residents and for us as electeds. So even prosecutors have been doing a great job. What he would like to do is to create a city attorney inspector. And this would be an individual who does the follow-up interviews when a case is referred from the police department to the city attorney's office for prosecution. Up till now, it's been a police officer interviewing the victims. Some victims are not comfortable with that. And so this would be someone separate and apart from that. And um, even is looking to uh, start a pilot program, hiring a part-time inspector to do this work. And I, I like the sound of that. I will say I'm thrilled with our city attorney, really um, a very innovative approach to things, and also our both of our public safety chiefs, um, Nick Luby at FIRE and Nishant Joshi at um, police. And with that, I mean, uh, yeah, Nishant Joshi, police chief. <laughs> and with that, I would um, love to introduce uh, your city manager, uh, my city manager to Jennifer Ott, Jen. Uh, you know, we got to know her. It's been my pleasure to work with Jen in the 13 years you uh, she was in Alameda before she took a little hiatus to go off to um, the city of Hayward. But I was just telling someone the other day, it is such a pleasure. She was always a pleasure to work with and so sharp and so on top of things. But now she comes to us with that administrative experience from working in a city of about 180,000, I want to 160. say. 160. Mm -hmm. 160, but that's still, you know, twice as big as our as our town and just, you know, all the issues. And um, she she has a stellar reputation. I cannot tell you how many people say, oh, you're so lucky to have gotten her. We know we are, we are. Um, and so um, without further ado, I just want to say we're so lucky to have Jen back and I'm going to turn the Zoom over to her or back to you, Zach, whichever way you'd like to do it um, so you oh. can hear from her directly. Thanks. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Jen, Great. if you want to speak. Take yeah. it away, Great. Jen. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Zach and Meredith and everyone for hosting me tonight. Um, uh, I see a number of familiar either faces or names there, so it's great to um, kind of see you again. Um, but I'm really excited. And for those of you who don't know me, I, as the mayor mentioned, I worked for the city for 13 years, started out in development services, 
um, and really with a focus on development related work, and then ended up taking over the Navy base uh, oversight um, and eventually transportation planning as well, and managed the base for eight years. Um, so I have a lot of uh, background in real estate and urban development, and it's kind of where my heart is, um, but also just been working in local government for over 20 years. So just kind of seen a lot, and I love the work, and I was telling um telling someone, you know, why, because it is, you know, as you guys mentioned earlier, it is, it's hard work too. And the mayor knows, and all of us know, I mean, just to get housing approved or, um, but I think what I love so much about local government is just how tangible the work we do is, where you really see the results and the change in people's lives. And, you know, you think of people who work in the federal government or even state government, I just don't think you have that level of satisfaction. We also obviously have the the involvement that's very, which we love, right? It's a lot, it's, sometimes this can be controversial. You might not see that when you're removed from a community, but but that's part of what I love about it. What I'm passionate about is being able to see how we can really change streets. We can change people's lives by providing them housing or um, services. So um, I come to this work with a lot of passion and um, went to Hayward for four years as assistant city manager, still with a focus on some real estate, but also overseeing uh, a lot of the external facing functions of the city, uh, public works and maintenance and um, housing and economic development. So anyway, just really glad to be back. I love Alameda. And um, I think the mayor talked a little bit more about kind of those larger policy um, efforts. And I thought I would just for a second, just talk a little bit about, you know, being a new city manager, more of the organizational approach and what we're looking at. And I think, you know, there's no secret that there's, I mean, even when I was in uh, working for the city, there had been a lot of um, turnover in the city manager's office and in just those last six months with a number of interims and things. So I, I think a lot of my focus is on stability and just trying to create, um, and the way that we're we're doing that is a couple different ways. The first thing we started doing was a strategic plan for the city so that the council could really lay down what their vision is, what the strategic priorities for the city are, um, and then what those projects and work plan are over the next three years. Um, and you would you won't be surprised to know that they align very closely with your with your priorities, the club and the mayor's priorities. So you really have housing, transportation, infrastructure, community services, and safety, and then more of the internal facing. So uh, inclusive and fiscally sustainable governance are really kind of they haven't been approved, but that's where they're headed. And then we're working just on Monday night, even for the council to talk about projects and a work plan and what that helps us do if the council comes in agreement and coalesces over a work plan, it's really meant to be a working document. We don't expect there not to be changes over the next three years, but it gives us kind of a way for the council and staff to feel like we're all on the same page, the community too, that these are the priorities we're working on. And if something changes, then we just have a conversation. Well, if, if we do that new thing, what else won't we be able to do? And we're able to have conversations about trade-offs um, and, and staff capacity and workload. And um, so we're able to have those conversations in a very transparent um, and open way. So that's one way that we can really try to have staff and the city manager and the community and the council kind of get on the same page about where we're headed as a city. Um, and then that really the intent is that that will funnel and integrate into the budget, the two-year budget, which we're doing right now as well. And that starts May 4th. We'll, uh, well, actually, May 2nd, we're at a regular council meeting. We're going to start the budget conversation and continue over the next couple of weeks. And so that'll really, and so we can ask our question, our, ourselves, well, we say these are our priorities. Well, does the budget reflect that? Do we have, um, and, and that way we can make sure our strategic priorities are funneling into where our funding is going and where, our, um, so those are things that are kind of, you know, I mean, not quite as exciting as some of these other topics, but are things that are important to me and um, to make sure that we're creating a stable organization and can really deliver on a lot of the policy objectives of the council. Um, lastly, I will say Alameda Point is also something that has demanded and you know, a lot of attention and focus of the council. And so really trying, we, in some of the early months, getting a disposition or a strategy for how we're going to sell and lease buildings out there. So we did that as well. And that allows us to kind of, again, with the council, be on the same page about which buildings we want to sell, which ones we want to lease, and really start to focus on not only attracting new job users and um, and users that bring great economic development benefit to the city, but also some of those housing projects. So that to get at your question, Zach, about implementation of the housing element, I mean, the city owns a ton of public land, and that is a great way that we can leverage 25% of the units out at the base will be re restricted for affordable housing. So we are 
working very hard on a couple of um, larger housing development um, transactions right now we hope to bring to the council in the summer um, so really using and leveraging our public land to to address those issues awesome. i'll stop there and yeah hope, yeah answer lots of questions <laughs> yeah thank you um yeah i just on that i was kind of curious um I, we have a pretty diverse sort of uh, and rich history in Alameda, and I'm curious, like how how what are your plans to sort of engage with residents to on the decision making process to ensure like everyone's being heard on a lot of these issues when it comes to things that involve your role as the city manager and with the staff that you oversee, um, and in all the decisions that are made up in Alameda, not just through the policy body, but just from from your your standpoint. Yeah, I mean, this is something fundamental. And I mean, all of my, all of the work that I've done and in, in both Alameda and Hayward is that we always need to stop and make sure we're listening along the way. And that doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean process with no outcome, right? I just want to make that clear. We don't, we don't just listen and not deliver. We need to do both. And I think really being, but really um, making sure that any policy or program, um, we're talking to people about it, being open and transparent about it, talking to really to the people who are going to be most affected by it as well, not just the loudest voices sometimes and making sure we're being proactive about seeking out all voices because there are different ways that different policies and programs can affect lots of different communities um, and not just the ones that show up to a community meeting and so we so that that's something i even said to all of our executive team i think maybe on the first day is you know make sure you know any any staff report any program you know make sure you're asking yourself what are all the ways that i've engaged the community about this issue and if you can't if you don't have a long list then maybe you need to you know go back and make sure you do have a long list when you do bring it to the council because it's it's really and not just to do it as like a checklist right but really something well are we listening and even sometimes when we hear things we don't that are hard to hear or um we don't you know that might be you know as the mayor mentioned sometimes that the meetings aren't always super nice and friendly but that's okay but like what what are the what's driving people and a lot of times what's driving them is something really really important that we need to try to address or um and so trying to really listen to not just the words of what people say but what what's really kind of the values that they're bringing to the table and so that's an integral part of any any project. So even like the disposition strategy for Alameda Point, the first thing we did was hold a meeting with all the tenants. And we sat down, we had 50, 50 people from the different businesses out there. It's like, what do you guys think we should do with these buildings? What are the things you like about Alameda Point? Um, and then we talked to developers too, like they have a voice and they're going to be the ones bringing a lot of the money and investment. So what asking them those questions, and that's how we really develop good policies that we can feel comfortable recommending to the council is by making sure we're, we're listening. That's awesome. Uh, my next question is mostly, I guess, for both of you, uh, and and you touched a little bit about this on uh, when you were speaking, Marilyn, on specifically in climate change, and environmental justice. They're they're big aspects of at least the California Democratic Party, um, but just in general, we are a coastal city, and sea level rise is a big concern for a lot of our residents. And just what specific policies? What are your plans? Sort of how can we address that in a way that. Um, can be tangible for our community um, because we we have that report that came out um, in I think it was the Mercury News about liquefaction and Alameda and earthquake preparedness and, um, and that plays into sort of this climate change issue as well. Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are on just being prepared for that situation, both long term, short term, and how we are going to take care of that as a as a community. Um, and I'll I'll open it up to both of you, but if you want to go yeah. first. Yeah. Thank you. Um the the it was a story in the Mercury News. Um it was not clear to me that the woman from US Geological Survey was talking about Alameda and specifically or just liquefaction in general, but be that as it may. Um and then, you know, having someone who is maybe a former newspaper editor and leads historical talks as one of the sources is, you know, maybe not as scientific as you might. Have, have gone. But in any event, Jen, do you want to talk a little bit about our approach? So Jen, when she was chief operating officer at Alameda Point, um, was, you know, oversaw the way that we're putting in our buildings, the way we're doing managed retreat, and some of the ways you want to just start and talk a little bit about that. And Sure, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, I think Alameda Point's a good case study for 
how we're looking at the rest of the city too. Um, but the you know before we can do any development out at the base, it needs new all in all new infrastructure, so new sewers, water, all of that. But when we really can't even build that if we don't you know if our if it's underwater or we're not addressing flood risk or long term sea level rise. And so one of the first things we looked at working with engineers and experts was to really try to project and have assumptions about sea level rise is the very basis of our planning out at the Navy base. And, and then also, in, even just in the technically in the way that we build infrastructure, what type of infrastructure. Um, and so that's part of the overall planning for all of Alameda Point. And there's different ways we achieve it. There are areas that are close to where kind of the original um, land, you know, because that is a lot of that's fill, not all of it, but a lot of it is. And I will say one of the things I, I kind of took exception to that article about is that we are not alone. I mean, sure, are there risks and are there things we need to do to mitigate and prevent in terms of disasters? But we are not alone. There are so many communities along the waterfront in the Bay Area that are confronted with the same thing. And this trade off of do you just constrain land and not use land that's, that has risk of liquefaction? And then where are we going to put all these new housing units? And what are we going to, you know, how do we achieve all these different goals? And like all policy issues, we have to balance both of those. So how do we protect for sea level rise, but still allow housing to move forward um, so that we still, that we can really plan for growth and in, in a sustainable way. So we looked at both fill, like so on areas that are closer to the higher levels of elevation, we can use fill, which means bringing in new soil to kind of raise the property out of the um, floodplain. But then we also had long-term plans for a levee along the perimeter so that we could protect areas that were in historic districts or just weren't realistic to bring new fill in. Um, and then even further allowed for the growth of those levees. So it was called adap adaptive management so that we could because the projections are all, you know, a lot of projections are different and a lot of them are exceeding even the projections that we planned for back then. So making sure that we have land reserved for for growth of um, levies, having funding sources that we collect from all the developers out there to make sure that we've got money in the event we need to expand those levies. Um, and then there's some areas which are pretty exciting. I think there might even be, is it, oh, there was a meeting on, on Saturday about Deep Pave Park, which is in some of these areas like the Northwest Territories Park and Deep Pave Park, where we said, we're going to have managed retreat. We're actually turn what used to be pavement into ecological areas um, and habitats um, and uh, be able to continue to have public access there, but essentially allow the Bay to return to these areas that once were Bay that were filled in. And so, you know, it doesn't make sense to protect all of the land mass out there and let some of it kind of return back. And so we've planned for that as well. And, and I'll just jump in a little bit about the infrastructure, but yeah, thank you, Jen, for what you were planning, what you said. And, and as far as the building, do bear in mind that any construction that is done has to meet whatever current California building code law is. And, and this is a state where we know about earthquakes and we know about floods. And so the for new construction and the buildings that will go up and the way they're sited, that, that's all going to be taken into consideration. Right now, we've got a couple of projects going on that are probably causing disruption. I apologize to any of you who have been stuck in traffic, but East Bay Med you may know is bringing new lines um, underwater across the estuary and into Alameda, especially around um, Alameda Landing, Mariner Square. It's been kind of a nightmare, but the good news about that is this is protecting our drinking water supply, and so that these you know these new conduits are going to be much safer and stable for seismic activity and all of that. And then over along, I want to say it's Buena Vista or thereabouts, and more the middle of the island. Yes, East Bay Med had to go in and open up the roadway and go in and do repairs, but that's because all of a sudden a sinkhole appeared somewhere in, in the vicinity of the Oakland Coliseum, or if you went out High Street in the frontage road to the Coliseum, and they realized there was a failure of, of one of their pipes. And so then they said, ooh, maybe we better do this procedure where we go with a camera along, like, uh, along the whole route. And they found that there were areas in um, Alameda that were susceptible. So they went in to catch them do the repairs and replacement before it was a crisis. And this was, you know, this is how we keep things like sewage from getting into the water supply or into the bay. Um, but I can tell you, I've gotten a number of angry emails. Nobody likes 
getting stuck or detoured in traffic, but we, we're we not like a brand new city with all new infrastructure. And so we are taking this seriously and going through and making sure that um, this is addressed. Um, so. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have, I'm going to try to mix one of the questions that we have from one of our members with one that I was planning to ask already. So this might be kind of a broad question. So it speaks to economic development for the city of Alameda and how we encourage businesses, but also income inequality and workers' rights. They're important issues for the Democratic Party and things that we care about. And so I think two things like how Alameda has a lower um, minimum wage than Oakland right now, but also we're dealing with things like 25% vacancy in some of our like business areas like Alameda Landing and how we balance that with sort of encouraging businesses to come to Alameda. I know we have things like the price cap on Uber Eats and, and DoorDash, where we're competing with those kind of sort of incentives to sort of protect our businesses, but at the same time compete so we can bring businesses in, but at the same time we're protecting our workers. So kind of opening this question up to both of you, just asking, like, how do we encourage new businesses to come to Alameda at the same time, keep businesses here, sustain businesses, and make sure that our community is thriving and we have things on islands. We don't have to commute to Oakland for, for retail or for food or anything like that. And really just make our community better. <laughs> uh, either one of you, I can just open it up. I'll, I'll jump in and say that um, we, we try to be very business friendly, whether it's our large businesses, small or in between. And we have a great team at economic development that um, keeps in touch with our businesses and with our business associations to see what they need. Um, certainly during the height of the pandemic, we made funds available, whether it was through ARPA or even some funds of our own to help our businesses um, stay open. Not, not all of them survived, but I will say that new businesses come to Alameda all the time for a number of reasons. Part of it is we are a safe community and um, it's also uh, just a nice community to do business. We have these connections. Uh, we have vibrant downtowns. Both of our downtowns are doing pretty well, not to say there aren't vacancies. With the, um, what, what I would say about Alameda Landing, and I haven't drilled down to know all the reasons people are leaving, but there certainly is a shift away from brick and mortar businesses as people do more of their shopping online, I would encourage and implore all of you to think and buy local first before you go to your keyboard. I know it's it's tempting and I do it too some of the time, but if at all possible, frequent your local businesses and you'd be surprised what they can order from you um, if you were just willing to wait for a little bit. But there's also opportunities because we do know it's not just in Alameda that shopping centers are struggling. And so that's why there's litigation that was, uh, litigation, legislation that was passed in Sacramento that allows there to be residential infill in existing shopping centers. And we have some really, it's part of our housing element. We have some really exciting opportunities at the Harbor Bay um, Shopping Center at South Shore and at, oh, is it Marina Village? But, you know, maybe Alameda Landing might be one of them sometime because, again, for instance, I know that in Harbor Bay, it will always be required to have at least 30,000 square feet of grocery store and another prescribed amount of commercial space. So we're not creating food deserts. We're not creating just residential. It's mixed use. But it's a win-win because it brings customers to the businesses and it brings businesses closer to um, the residents. It's very convenient. And shopping centers tend to be built on transportation lines. So there's there's bus service um, there. So um, and, and I can tell you just on a larger scale, like when we're looking at businesses that come to our business park. When I did our um, my State of the City address a um, month or so ago, I asked Economic Development Department to give me a list and a summary of all the new businesses that had come to Alameda in the last year. And it was like having to pick your favorite child or something. There were just so many. And so I just picked like representative um, uh, samples and we would hear things like, well, you know, we looked all around, we had a radius that we all the way down to Santa Cruz and up to whatever, and we just kept coming back to Alameda. And part of it is the quality of life, employers 
want to to both work and live here and that's why i'm really um encouraging growth of of these businesses we have biotech we have um a lot of you know exciting innovative companies that also have jobs and job offerings oftentimes at all different levels so i want people in alameda to be able to work there but i also want to keep creating this housing that people can afford to rent or to buy. And some of it, like the housing at the shopping center, that's going to be affordable by design because those are going to be smaller units, just um, practically speaking, to be able to fit 300 units at the Harbor Bay Shopping Center. But that, that makes it affordable by design. So even if you didn't qualify for the income levels for, you know, um, the prescribed affordable housing, you might be able to get into one of those because I saw, I skimmed the chat really quickly. And I'm also concerned that we need to have um, housing where um, our adult children can afford to come back and live. We need workers of all levels to be able to work here and not commute in long distances. Um, and that's a matter of equity. And then I think you all know that we are starting a pilot program. It's rolling out later this spring or in the summer, and it is um, a guaranteed um, basic income pilot program. It's going to run for two years. And um, I mean, that would be worth a, um, a presentation, I would think, sometime when it when it's up and running. But everything I know about um, these programs, and I'm part of Mayors for Guaranteed Basic Income, this is a way that we help people up. That helping hand is oftentimes in these situations all that people need to just have a little breathing room, not um, be constantly worried about, you know, how are we going to pay the rent or pay utilities or um, pay for medical costs. Just, um, and I don't want to get too far afield, but earlier today I um, was on a webinar, I mean, as um, you know, a spectator, a participant in a webinar that League of California Cities put on, but it was for and how do we ensure mental health in the workplace, but it really has a broader application for the community. And these two, and they partnered with Kaiser Permanente and these two mental health clinicians who were excellent and presented. And by the way, um, Jen, our, um, our HR director, Jessica Romeo was on the, <laughs> on the webinar with me. I saw her name, but um, they talked about to have mental health um, satisfactory mental health, you need three components. You need physical health, you need mental health, and you need social health. So what's social health? That wasn't a term that I knew. It means, do you have a place to live? Do you have enough food? Do you have enough money? Do you feel secure, safe where you are? And, and to me, as an elected official, that's a responsibility um, of the city. But I'd love to toss it back to Jen, because she's done a lot of work in economic <laughs> development. And, I'll rest my voice. Yeah, no, you said a lot of it. I mean, I think I'll just do a couple of things that might just supplement that. I, mean, I think the work we have, um, the chamber and two business districts that we work very closely with and have strong relationships with, and a lot of, you know, they're, they're, and those are where a lot of our small businesses are concentrated or on along those two business districts, Webster and Park Street. And so, you know, some of the things that we're helping them do, it may not sound, you know, really big big, but is like, for instance, special events. I, mean, I think to get at like what may be going on with Alameda Landing, I think people through COVID really enjoyed the interaction outside and having entertainment integrated with retail or restaurants and outdoor eating. And so I think what you saw on Webster Street of holding these different events and using outdoor space to attract people and create a sense of community, I think is super important. And they've struggled a little bit with Caltrans. And so we're doing, we're kind of revamping our permit process and, and trying to help them with some of the bureaucracy with Caltrans. And so we're trying to do things like that so they can continue to really thrive and be a draw for, for that, I think that community heart that they've become on the West End um, and doing some of the same things with, with DABA, the downtown businesses district. And then also just changing the way, I mean, but for both of them, thinking about the streets and the parklets and how we change the use of our public right-of-way to help support small businesses. And it's not easy because we've got a lot of competing interests with 
cars and bicyclists and restaurants and outdoor seating, but trying to kind of thread that needle and work with them and work with the different stakeholders to be able to use our public right away in a way that helps support them. So those are things that, you know, they're not big initiatives necessarily, but super important to supporting small businesses. And then um, lastly, I think in the same way that our public land at the base can be an attractor for housing and affordable housing, it's also a great way to attract amazing businesses. So for instance, one of the businesses that the mayor focus on with Science Corp, which is a business that's trying to use AI, and I don't understand it all, but AI to help kind of cure blindness. And there at Marina Village, they want to expand, I think, what was it, Mayor, from like 75 to 500 people over the next five years. Yeah. And we're going to, we're talking to them and trying to see if we can find a building for them out at the Navy base so that they can expand with 500 jobs in our community here. Um, so those are the ways we can leverage those big hangers out there and some of our assets in a way to really attract businesses. And I think something that I've heard from the mayor and other council is not just businesses that pay rent, which of course we want, you know, we need the money to help pay for infrastructure and other things, but that have a double bottom line. So Science Corp, where we can say, look, you're bringing jobs, but you're also really helping, you know, creating a public benefit for, for the, for all of us. So really trying to find those businesses that strike that double bottom line. I hope everyone is aware that out at um, our Marina Village um, Business Park, I think we call it Research Park, we have the 2020 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. Well, she was a co-winner with her partner, but Jennifer Doudna, um, who is a, um, a chemist who, um, well, she's a biochemist, but she won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for developing the CRISPR technology, which you've heard of um, genetic uh, gene editing. She's amazing. I happen to be reading her biography from the library, by the way. It's like 500 pages written by Walter Isaac Isaacson, who did you know Steve Jobs' biography. But she, um, when she and her partners um, started Scribe Therapeutics, they decided to locate in Alameda. And the thing about these kinds of businesses, when I talk to people, I haven't met her yet, I want to, but when I talk to others, these different businesses, how did you decide to come to Alameda? Well, I knew so-and-so at this other um, company, or we used to work together, and then they went to Alameda and said, wow, you ought to, you ought to come here. So it's, it, it makes us, as Jen said, we're, we are at a point where we can be selective. It's just not real estate that we're trying to lease or sell. We can decide, is this who we want? Is this a, is this a use um, that we would like to promote in Alameda? Would be We'd be proud to have them here, and um, and you should be proud too. We've got some great, uh, great businesses going on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you talked a little bit about um, the legislation to redevelop um, uh, commercial areas. That was AB twenty eleven. Buffy it was a bill that I actually helped sponsor, and I went to Sacramento to help lobby on. So um, I adore yeah. Buffy Wicks, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> She's amazing. Um, yeah, that was a big bill that we got through and and fought to to get passed and got got labor groups on board with and were able to make that happen. And it it by default requires it allows like by right redevelopment of commercial areas like something like Alameda Landing, but you also requires a, a major substantial portion be affordable housing while building mixed use um in that. So amazing it's a win-win. Win. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um uh taking a couple of questions that other people had just smaller stuff. Um the road to the wellness center being repaved. I know that is um owned by the state, I believe. Um, but someone was asking about that one um, specific. I mean, if Andrew Thomas is here, he'd probably say it. But <laughs> yeah. Jen, do you know? Um, are, are I you... know there was. We had a. We actually had a water leak there that we're getting resolved with um, the park district, and um, so I think the park district manages that on behalf of the state. But I agree. I don't know all the details, so I can't say for sure. Um, but it's something I'm happy to get more information about and get back to you on. But on but I will say when we get these calls, emails, whatever from residents, we don't just say, oh, that's mm. someone else's problem. I, Jen, I'll tell you offline a story I heard about another city who, that I won't mention the name um, in a different <laughs> county, actually. But it was amazing the runaround people were getting about trees falling and, you know, oh, it's not that's not our not our jurisdiction. We don't do that. We we reach out. And that's. You know, the beauty of Alameda um, is that I call us the right size city, you know, Goldilocks and the three bears, not too, <laughs> not too small, not too big. We're not big and bureaucratic. We 
are not so small that we don't have a, an adequate staff. I will say our staff are amazing and they stretch themselves almost thin, but we can do these things, but we also, we work well with our neighboring jurisdictions, other agencies on the climate change sea level front. We are part of a working group that Danielle Miller, our sustainability uh, coordinator helped start with 30 different agencies. I mean, some of them are our neighboring cities, Oakland and San Leandro, but the Port of Oakland, the East Bay Regional Parks District, BCDC, because climate change, sea level rise, it knows no jurisdictional boundaries. It doesn't stop at the city limits or the county lines. So we do need to work together, but we're also stronger together and um, we can work on, on um, projects and programs that protect us all. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Michelle Pryor, for that. That uh, <laughs> I saw that. The shout out to Public Works for the, yeah, we, um, man, if I had control over the wind and storms, I would have dialed it way back. But um, the next best thing was our Public Works Department and also public safety. And uh, uh, Jen, you may or may not know, on her um, second day of office, uh, second day on the job, what did you do on your second day on the job, Jen? I got to declare a local emergency, which after 20 years of government, I had never done before. So I was like, add that to the list of uh, fun things to do. So yes, terrifying. The, that New Year's Eve storm, right? Yes, yep. it was. And then a couple of them that came right after too. So yeah, it was it was a lot. But I, I agree, our public works department did an amazing job. I mean, all the departments did, but our public works were just on top of everything. So thank you for saying that, Michelle. Yeah. It was pretty amazing watching uh, across our Facebook groups and the Reddit and everywhere, people posting sort of how quickly things recovered with all the down trees and road closures that we had, but just how quickly we pulled things back and we were we were back to normal, um, even with the torrential rains that sort of hit us. Um, uh, Alameda kind of fared pretty well compared to some of the other cities, so I think it's a testament to our public works department. Yeah, I would agree. I hope we didn't jinx anything by saying that, but I, <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> Uh, there was a question about, um, I, as a Democratic Club, we're trying to put a, together a program on electrification, so more on that later, but um, there was a question about subsidies for programs, or if you want to put it about it, Mary. Yeah, Danielle is going to present on electrification in July. Tell us all how we're going to pay for our heat pumps. Yeah. <laughs> I'll attend that one and find out. No, that's good. You, you will be um, in good hands um, with Danielle Miller. Great. That's good yeah. to know. So that was one of the other questions. So specifically, it was just about subsidies, but I think we can cover that in that next program, and I think it'll be it'll be a good place to talk about that. The only other one I had, and these are just sort of little stuff: um, Barton Alameda, pedestrian bridge, um, the supporting. We had the AC Transit line that would the AC Transit board voted down or to not renew the uh, line seventy eight. But just how are we going to get that? I mean, everyone talks about build us another bridge, but <laughs> we're not going to get a single occupant car bridge. I think that's impossible. But I think what kind of things um, uh, between the two of you, are you sort of pushing our regional bodies and, and other agencies to sort of bring that to us like CTC or, or Caltrans or ABAG or anybody so that we can make that happen? Let me jump in on Bart really quickly. Um, <laughs> Jen knows this. I um I was on a webinar, U.S. Conference of Mayors, um, oh, a couple of weeks ago or so, and um, I it was last month, I guess, and uh, it was it was about struggling public transit systems. This is a nationwide webinar. It wasn't very well attended, like forty one people. Usually, we have a couple hundred at least. But I was on, and I was really interested. And I I made a comment about you know I'm from a Bay Area mayor in California, and we have. Bart Bay Area Rapid Transit, which has really been struggling with the change in commuter patterns, more people working remotely, but also safety issues that people, um, there was a time when Bart had more ambassadors, they called them, I think, on the trains and helping to um, deal with issues that might come up with unsheltered people or people having difficulties. And, and it's, you know, is there federal funding that could help them with this? And so then a couple of days later, I see my city manager at the, I think it was the table at the <laughs> state of the city luncheon. She said, so I heard you're mad at Bart about something. And I said, 
I'm not mad at Bart. I love Bart. Where you? Something about the U.S. Conference of Mayors. I said, oh, my gosh. Somebody on that was carried it back to Bart. Uh -huh. And so um, I said, no, 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 not at all. And um, But Jen and I did have a conversation, which was a good one to have with someone who's very highly placed at the U.S. Department of Transportation, not the secretary, um, Secretary Buttigieg. Love to meet him sometime, but I haven't. But anyway, what this gentleman told us is, you know, um, right now with Congress, it would be very hard to get funding for these um, local transit systems that are struggling because this is Congress. This, they tend to mostly be in large urban centers, which tend to be mostly democratic. And so it's, you know, it's just the way it is. And, but that, you know, locally, regionally. And so, so that's a good thing. And I mean, that's a good thing to know. And then we'll focus to see what can be done. So as far as the BART expansion to Alameda, I would just say, I've been reading about BART and other transit um, system struggles. And it sounds like the best advice is for right now, because we need to get them off back from that financial cliff that they're on, they need to hunker down and just do what they need to do to keep the trains running now before thinking about expansion, before thinking about adding new routes, because the worst possible thing would be that the system fails and we don't have BART and so many people rely on that system in our region. So I'm, you know, it's all about timing. You don't get everything you want the minute you you want it. Um, but Jen is right when you said we do get to see results. It's really exciting. So the, the BART to Alameda, I, I'm willing to, you know, right now for the immediate future, we'll see. I will tell you, I don't think this is any secret I can't share, but I was up in Sacramento with um, Alameda County Transportation Commission. I, I chair a policy committee. So the policy committee chairs and our executive director and the officers um, went up to Sacramento for some lobbying. And we were in Buffy Wick's office and we were, because we're talking about transportation, she's concerned too about these systems. And um, she said, right now among the leadership they're grappling with in 2024, do they bring a big affordable housing bond to, to the, the ballot, or do they bring a transit a measure to the ballot? Because she said, we, we just can't afford to lose our transit systems. But she also said, though, that we've got to do the, the polling first and see where the voters are, because if people aren't willing to reach into their pockets, then there's, you know, it, it's, it's expensive to mount a campaign. But, um, and then the bicycle pedestrian bridge, I think I talked about that. I think that's what you're referring to. We were really sorry to hear that the Line 78 pilot from um, Fruitville BART to um, the Seaplane Lagoon ferry terminal is, will be terminating. Was it, it's in August, August. I want to say, Jen? Yeah, yeah. Um, we probably would have appreciated knowing about the vote before it was taken, but you know, these things happen. Um, and uh, um, anyway, we'll, we'll keep doing what we can. And, but I mean, AC Transit is, is a really important system for our city too. So we wanna make sure that uh, they, they are um, operating as efficiently as possible. And, um, and we, Jen and I had a good Zoom with our new, um, AC Transit Board Rep Sarah Syed. Um, Jen, do you want to add anything on the, the yeah, just a, yeah, yeah, just a couple smaller things. Is one is that May 16th, we have invited, and I haven't told you this, Mayor, but invited Bart to come out and talk about the Link 21. So we are going to be doing a presentation. So if you want to let your membership know if they're interested in hearing the status or asking questions or coming to the to the meeting. So that that will be interesting to hear. Um, because I know that some of the funds they've gotten for that project, at least from a planning standpoint, are really segregated from their operating dollars. So they may be able to continue, but I do think it's certainly talking about expanding right now when they're not even sure they can kind of stay in business. It's um, they might not, they're probably not going to be pushing too hard. But we're if they do have expansion plans, we will be advocating for a station in Alameda pretty um so we'll be making sure that they hear that on the 16th as well. Um, and then, oh, on the line 78, what some of the, what we are looking at, even though that line itself, had, you know, isn't moving forward right now, we are trying to do some lessons learned and some things that we did see that we thought were encouraging that we want to make sure we figure out a way to try to serve. 
um, were actual residents of Alameda Point that were using it to get across town because they want to get to Webster Street or Park Street, and they were writing it. So even though there might not have been um, as many people taking it across town to actually get to the ferry terminal, people were using it um, on different legs. And so we're trying to drill down a little bit and study what the what where were those little glimmers of light and so trying to make sure we continue to try to provide service to those constituents because that's great news right that's what we want as people moving into Alameda Point is supposed it's supposed to be a TOD and then you're not getting in their cars and driving across town so you know even though that that line itself may not have worked out I think we're still hopeful that we can kind of continue to learn from it. And speaking of uh, not jumping in their cars, I just want to throw out a statistic that I heard from Andrew Thomas um, late last year. He gets from the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, statistics on the number of registered vehicles in Alameda and then, you know, from a range of years. So Andrew told me that the statistics for Alameda from 2017 to 2022 showed that in 2022, there were almost 4,900 fewer registered vehicles in Alameda than in 2017. And when you stop and think about the building that was done in Alameda in those intervening years, we added more homes. But it's what we said that um, all along, that if you build homes close to transit, if you build the, in areas that are walkable and you give people options, and we require all of our developers to provide a transit pass, an easy pass to, to residents or employees of new businesses that come in um, that or pay into a transit, um, the TMA. But so the, the number of registered vehicles went down. And on top of that, almost 10% of registered vehicles in Alameda are electric vehicles. And that is higher than the state average. And um, and then the other just little fun fact I heard recently from a couple of young parents who I encountered uh, with those you know cargo bikes where they have the kids in the cart and all that. And I said, oh, this is really impressive. One dad told me in a year's time last year, he put 800 miles on the odometer of his bike that he takes his kids to preschool and school with. Those are vehicle miles not traveled. And I mentioned that at a um, at a city council meeting. And the very next day, I was helping judge a science fair at Bay Farm Elementary. And one of the volunteer parents came up and she said, you know, Mayor, I heard what you said about that dad, 800 miles. I just want you to know, I did a thousand miles on my bike. And so I'm thinking of a competition or contest or something, but, but anyway, it is exactly true that if you build the infrastructure and we have residents who come here and they get it, that we, and the earth is fragile. We, we know that living here on the edge of the water, it's already here. So we have to do our part to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the good news is people are doing it. So I am, I am inspired by our residents. Fantastic. I think um, I have some stretch questions, but I think they would get too long to sort of <laughs> jump into those topics at this point with the time that we have left. So I think this might be a great place just to say uh, thank you to both of you for coming. This was fantastic. We're both lucky to have both of you um, and uh, the club. I extend our gratitude to you um, for coming to um, introduce yourselves to our club again and uh, to let everyone know what the plans are for Alameda over the next few years. And I think this was a great discussion, really dived into some of the topics that we care about as Democrats, but also as a community in Alameda and um, the, the issues that are germane to us. Um, and uh, with that, um, unless you, Meredith, have anything that you want to bring up at all, um, otherwise... <laughs> All right, we can call it now and uh, yes. just have a good one. And thank you so much. And um, reminder again, in June, we're having our, our save the date for our uh, event in uh, at Alameda Point for our first in-person event for the year. And then hopefully we'll have a float in the uh, parade coming up as well. So that's going to be great. Oh, yes. Uh, Sarah Henry would be really upset if I didn't say it. So good. Yes, we need we need floats in the parade. That would be lovely. Um, thank you so much. And thank you to the City of Alameda Democratic Club for all you do. It is these democratic values that help us achieve what we're achieving. And it makes me um, very proud to be the mayor of this city. So thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, everybody. Yes, and Meredith, happy to come back anytime. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Likewise. Great to see you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank good you night. so much. Have a good night. You too. Thanks, everyone.